This is the cross halving joint. It's fairly simple to make and commonly used in a variety of small timber projects. It's great for junior students as it involves a range of simple hand tools which develops general skills and dexterity. As the name suggests, the joint is formed by removing half the width or thickness from two pieces of timber and then joining them to form a single hole. In this example, we'll remove the width. Simply mark out the joint on the timber. Use the marking gauge to determine the depth of cutting. Make some simple saw cuts to assist with taking out the waste. Use a chisel to cut out the waste. Flip the timber around to ensure you don't tear out the other side. And because you've cut it all correctly, simply repeat for the other piece and then join the two pieces together for a perfect fit. Well, it would be nice if it worked that way the first time, every time. Hi, I'm Colin Klupik. In this video, we're going to have a look at how to make a cross halving joint. And we're also going to have a look at how to take a class through the process of making a cross halving joint. As you'll see, it's going to take more than one practice go, but that's okay. Let's have a look. You're going to need the simple hand tools for woodworking as shown, and a couple of pieces of practice timber. Astute viewers will notice an essential item missing here. And yes, of course, it's the steel ruler. You always need one of these. Using the track saw, I'm cutting two pieces of 42 by 19 mm thick pine at about 220 mm length each. This is the profile of what needs to be removed. The timber to be removed is half the width and the thickness of the timber. Rather than try to mark out the thickness of the timber, it's easier to place one piece on top of the other, set it at 90 degrees with the tri-square, and mark out the edges of where the two pieces will intersect. Then use the tri-square to mark across the width on both sides. Next we'll need to mark the depth of cut, which is essentially half the width of the timber. This timber is 42mm wide, so the marking gauge will need to be set at 21mm. Scribe a line between the two pencil lines, the groove left by the pin will form a useful guide for the chisel later on. To make the joint more obvious, you can run a pencil line through the groove and clearly mark the waist. You can now start to get a sense of how this works. Remember, this might be very simple to you, but for students this is very new, and it will test their manual dexterity. Now the waist needs to be cut out. You can see here that the tenon saw cut is on the waist side of the line, as the saw cut will take out material equal to the thickness of the blade. This is called the saw kerf. Keeping fingers well clear and pointing in the direction of the blade, carefully make cuts on the inside of each line. Start slowly until the saw naturally takes hold and wants to cut freely. Then make one or two intermediate cuts. By this stage, much of the material has been cut out already. To chisel out the rest, place your thumb in the rounded part of the chisel handle and wrap your fingers around the blade. Using a mallet, you can then start to chip out the waste. Be careful not to tear out the other side by not chiseling all the way through. Turn the timber around and come in from the other side. You can see here that the saw cuts weren't perfectly on the line and there is some adjusting to do down on the lower edge. Changing your grip on the chisel, you can vertically pair out the remainder of the waste. You need to have nicely sharpened chisels for this, otherwise it's just irritating. 
You can also use a steel ruler to check for flatness across the bottom of the joint surface. This will ensure the two pieces come together flat. Then test for fit. It should slide together easily with minimal resistance. Once the students have cut one like this, they'll take the other piece of timber and try to convince themselves that it really works and that it's actually okay, and they'll push it in. Now this one slides in okay, but the overall fit isn't that great. Uh, it could be better. So they'll fiddle with it and then they'll try and press it in. If it's too tight, they'll try and push it in. If it's too loose, they'll convince you that it still works. Instead of fussing over the one that isn't quite right, encourage them to do another one and another one and another one and another one. And then when they're done on this piece of timber, they can then go to this piece of timber and do one here and here and here and here. So that they end up getting maximum value out of their timber. And then they can play with the different joints and see which ones actually work uh, and why and make some notes as to why they did certain ones better than others. As the students start to work through them, it's not a bad idea to start numbering them. So this was the first one, number two, number three, and you can see here that these ones here are getting better as we go along. So number two is not so great. In fact, something you might often see is that students will probably chip out the timber and it will start to actually break away like this. So that's no good. Um, number three is probably the best so far, but here I've marked out number four, uh, ready to go on that one. And here we go marking out the next lot of joints. You could expect to spend about two lessons going through this process, depending on how large your class is and how quickly they're picking it up. Practicing the marking out multiple times is a very useful process for students, although it might not appear that way to them straight away. I've just marked out the next four joints here, and I just thought I'd point something out at this stage. I've actually labeled these five, six, seven, and eight to go on from the one, two, three, four here. One thing that students will want to do is they'll want to go pretty hard with the pencil lines like this one here. They'll want to go pretty dark and they'll also tend to mark beyond where the joint needs to be. Now that's fine for a practice joint, but I would encourage them to keep the pencil lines nice and light. So these ones down here are a little bit lighter, but I still have to make them darker so that the camera can see them. The problem with making your pencil lines dark on the timber is that it makes them very hard to rub off. And the students will then say, oh, it's okay. Can I just, Oh, I'll just sand it off. And you go, well, you can, but <laughs> trying to sand it off, uh, you'll find that you've actually left a dent in the timber and you've got to do a lot of sanding before both the pencil line and the dent that it's left disappear. So I would avoid that and I would keep the pencil lines nice and light. So here we are with practice joints numbers 9, 10 and 11. Would I go to this level of practice with a class before starting a project which required the use of a cross halving joint? Yes, absolutely I would. And that's because you can see here that after that many cuts, this one is actually starting to look much better. And the same will go for the students as well. You'll end up with a workshop full of these, but that's okay. And the students will be able to look back on their work and see which ones worked and which ones didn't. For example, that one worked, that one was pretty good. These ones here, on the other hand, were a little bit bodgy. So it's good for the students to be able to see their progress. This is a good time to mention some workshop management. A class full of practice joints will result in a fair bit of dust and chips. It's very tempting for students to blow the dust away from where they're working. I strongly suggest encouraging them to clean as they go and to use a dustpan and broom or a vacuum. Once they've had plenty of practice, you might like to give them two new pieces of timber to try their best attempt. Mark out the thickness. Mark across the width. Use the marking gauge to set the depth of cut. Clearly indicate the waist. Make some careful tenon saw cuts. Remove the rest with a chisel. Be careful not to tear out the timber. Make some final adjustments and check for fit. Astute viewers will have noticed here that there is in fact a bit of tear out. Try to avoid this. Then see if the joint sits flat on the bench. So there you have it, the cross halving joint. It's a simple joint that you can use with your students in stage four, five, and even six, depending on the project that they're making. The question is, 
When you're starting, how much time do you give to practicing the joint? Do you do it once or twice? Or do you get the students to do it many times, as we've seen in this video? Well, the benefits to doing it many times are reasonably obvious. Practice makes perfect. And it will also raise the level of quality right across the board in your workshop in terms of what the students can do and how they think about their projects. I strongly encourage you to try it many times and to spend just that one or two extra lessons with your students practicing joints like this before you actually apply them to your projects. We'll see you in the next video.